Scripture reading for this morning comes out of the gospel. It's Mark 1, 33 through 39. You should be able to follow along on the screens behind me. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, Jesus, everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. This is the word of God this morning. Let's pray together. So last year I got a car that now has uh, this capacity for Bluetooth and it's opened up, you know, this all my music library to be able to, to listen to whatever music I want to on Spotify or whatever, listen to podcasts. And it's really a pretty cool feature having a car with Bluetooth. Uh, but there is one downside if you, if you know this, if, you, if your car has this, and that is when you turn the car on and, and the radio's on, it just starts, and, and that's on, it starts randomly playing a song. It just out of blue starts playing a song, and it's, it's never the song you want to be playing at that time. Uh, and it's just, yeah, there it is. And I don't know why, it always picks some for my Christmas selections for whatever reason. Uh, and it's just a sin to listen to Christmas music outside of December. Um, and so, you know, I'm listening to this, and I think this is, this is kind of annoying. Uh, and I discovered a brand new song. You get it for 99 cents on iTunes. In fact, it has become, it's one of the top 50 selling songs uh, on, on all of iTunes. Uh, and it's called A Very Good Song. Seems like a really nice name. Um, but, but what's unique about this song is that there's no musical instruments and no vocals. It's 10 minutes of silence. 10 minutes of blissful, wonderful silence. And the reason they, they made this song and the reason it's going, becoming so popular is that it's, it's, it has like a, 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 a very good song. And so it defaults to be like the first thing alphabetically that your Bluetooth player will go to so that a, a person getting in their car has at least the first 10 minutes without the noise and the music and all of the other stuff that can fill our, our lives. Interesting, that's become one of the 50 top selling songs, a song that's just simply silence. And I think it speaks to the reality that we have lost it in our age. We've just lost the sense of silence. We live in such a noisy world and, and we're surrounded by it constantly. Uh, George uh, Prochnik uh, wrote a book, In Search of Silence, and he talks about the consequences to our lives as a result of this constant barrage of noise that we face. And he said this, he said, I think we're seeing noise tied to a host of problems of the age, problems of attention, aggression, insomnia, and general stress. Noise is the default position as our society. Isn't that so true? Noise is just forever with us, and we've lost that. But not only have we had the loss of silence in our day, we've had the loss of solitude, the ability to really be alone with yourself with your thoughts. It just seems to be something that uh, is no longer present, mostly because of the ever-present smartphone that keeps us plugged in and connected to the whole world around us all of the time. Sherry Turkle is a professor at MIT, and she has done a great deal of research over the years um, in the effect that, that technology is having upon us, and especially uh, uh, smartphones and tablets and stuff. And what she has discovered is that one hidden cost to our addiction to technology is the loss of solitude that rarely are we ever truly alone. 
And uh, she's, she's uh, uh, interviewed and studied hundreds of people. And, and people at stop signs, checkout lines at supermarkets where you used to have a, your mind used to have a little downtime. But now we fill it. We just turn immediately to the phone. Walk in any room in America and what do you see? You see people on their phones. You may see a group of people together. She says, this is profoundly affecting relationships. Walk in any room and you see might, might be six people in there. Are they talking to each other? No, they're all talking to their cell phones or on, online with that. And she's saying, this is, this is diminishing relationships. She says she interviews children who talk about their experiences with their parents and how a subject will come up and they don't know the answer. And the parent says, well, let me Google that because Google or Siri has the answer for everything, right? My daughter was talking at, 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 at his school, at his church. Um, Ethan, my five-year-old grandson, uh, was in a lesson. They were talking about Jesus returning and, and all of this. And she, he asked um, my daughter Stephanie, his mom, when is Jesus returning? And she said, I don't know. No one knows. And Ethan said, well, ask Siri. <laughs> because Siri knows everything, right? <laughs> And anyway, Sherry Turkle said that what, what kids are telling her is they're, is they're saying, I don't want you to go check Google. Just talk to me. Talk to me. And these moments that we used to have time to think and to dream and to, to, to have creative thoughts are, are lost now because of the technology so we've had this loss of solitude. And you know, some people are beginning to uh, profit off of this. They're beginning to sense that there's a real need and a hunger to kind of be detached. And so uh, a new type of vacation out there is growing in popularity. It's called black hole resorts. Have you ever heard of a black hole resort? A black hole resort is a high-end resort where uh, there is no Wi-Fi and no cell coverage. And people are paying big bucks to go to these resorts. Like there's one out in Big Sur, California, beautiful view of the ocean, just amazing setting, and no Wi-Fi, no cell coverage, no signals anywhere. For $2,200 a night, you can enjoy an evening at, uh, at this black hole resort. Maybe there's a cheaper way. Maybe there's a better way to recover what everybody living before us had the option for, the opportunity for, a solitude and silence. Well, Sherry Turco and her research at MIT mostly focuses on the impact and our thinking and creativity and on relationships. But I would suggest to you that the loss of silence and solitude has a profound impact upon our relationship with God. In fact, I think some of the deterioration we're seeing in America on spiritual matters has to do with this reality because it's stealing the time that we would have to hear from God away from us. And so today we begin a new series, three-part series called The Sound of Silence. And today what I want to do is I want to talk about when silence is golden. And I want to make this point that a serious pursuit of God requires solitude and silence. It's not just an option. It absolutely requires it. But then the rest of the series, we're going we're to take this kind of different angles. We're going to look at silence from several different angles. We're going to look at how it can be golden today. Next week, we want to talk about when it should be set aside and we should instead celebrate in the noise and the celebration of, of God and his goodness. And then the third week, I want to talk about when silence is absolutely deadly and get a perspective on, a Christian perspective on the hashtag Me Too reality that our world has been seeing. So that's where we're going with this series. And today we turn to Mark's gospel, which was read for us earlier. And in verse 35, it says this, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went to a solitary place where he prayed. Now, I've been, I've been mentioning the, te the challenges we have uh, with technology and how that is a real problem, but we're not new. This whole thi thing is not new just to our day. Jesus would have known a different kind of stressor because he lived in a small um, uh, Galilean village. And, and, I, and, and so like a village, maybe he was at the time was at Bethsaida. And Bethsaida was a village of about 700 people that could, that, that could fit actually in this room. That's how small it was. They were one-room houses where there would be anywhere from seven to 20 people living in that space. Can you imagine a one-room house with 20 other people living in it? You'd need some downtime, wouldn't you? 
You need some away time. And that's exactly what Jesus is looking for here. But it wasn't just here. And it wasn't just because he was in that village. We see this is a, is a regular reality with Jesus. Going on later in the Gospel of Mark, in, in chapter uh, 6, it says this, after leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. Um, let me back up. We'll look at some of those verses, but here's the reality. Jesus' ministry began with 40 days of silence and solitude. He gets baptized, which was a very public thing. John the Baptist is there, and a crowd of people are witnessing this, and he goes into the Jordan River, and he's baptized, and then the Spirit leads him out in the wilderness for 40 days. That's how he begins his ministry. And then how he ends his ministry is in the Garden of Gethsemane, where alone he wrestles with God in prayer. And hanging in the balance is the very salvation of the world. But what does he do? He gets alone to a quiet place in a garden. He begins in the desert. He ends in the garden. And then he takes these times. I read that passage from Mark where, where he goes to a mountainside. Uh, but look here in Luke's gospel. Look at this verse. This is telling. Verse 16 of chapter 5. But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. See that highlighted word? Often. It was a custom of Jesus. The next chapter in Luke. It says, one of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them who he designated apostles. So you get the idea? Jesus is going to settle on the 12 men who are going to uh, do ministry with him, do life with him, the ones who are going to be apostles. What an important decision. Because this is going to, the, the selection of these 12 guys is going to set the course of the church for generations to come. So what does he do? He spends the night praying about who he should select. Now here's what I'd, I'd ask. If Jesus, the Son of God, fully human, fully divine, needed that kind of time to pray and to seek God for an important decision, what does it say about us? And our need to pray when we're making important decisions, when we're thinking about future, the future course of things. And if Jesus had this regular custom of getting silent, getting alone with God, what does it say about our need for silence and solitude? It was a custom of Jesus. Now, I believe that he did this for several reasons. Um, I believe that, that Jesus sought this out because... Um, it was there that he found the power and the grace that he needed to do the ministry that he had. In the passage in Mark that was read from, from chapter 1, right before this, he's out doing healings, lots of healings. And then um, he goes and spends his time alone. And then he comes back and he goes out on a preaching mission and he's casting out demons. In one of the healings of, of Jesus, when he heals a woman um, a woman who comes up to him and touches him in the crowd, he says, I felt that power left me. A real insight there. What? When Jesus would heal somebody, it was like spiritual energy, spiritual power left him, and he needed to recharge. And again, if Jesus, the Son of God, needed this, how much more do we need to recharge when we expend energy for the work of God? So it was Jesus' custom and I would suggest that it's an important practice for every disciple. I agree with Henry Nouwen, who recently wrote this. He said, who, he died a few years ago, but he wrote towards the end of his life, he said, without solitude, it is virtually impossible to live the spiritual life. Virtually impossible without solitude. So silence and solitude are two different spiritual disciplines that maybe we don't think a lot about, but they're, they're ancient practices, it's what, the, these are what are called uh, practices of, of uh, disciplines of abstinence, where we abstain for something for a spe specific time. Now, there are spiritual disciplines of engagement, where we're engaging, we're doing something like reading the Bible, like gathering for worship, or like serving somebody. That's an engagement. And we Americans, we love, we're more activistic. We like that kind of thing. But then there are disciplines of abstinence. Fasting is one of them. We abstain from food for a certain period of time so that greater things, greater spiritual things might come as a reality. That's not saying that food is a bad thing. It's saying that we're actually doing, we're setting aside a good thing. 
We're setting aside food so that we may focus on something even more important. Well, sol silence and solitude are very similar. In this message and in this discipline, we're not saying that noise and music and sounds are somehow bad. Actually, God created it. He gave us two ears to take it all in and to enjoy the wonderful sounds around us. But there's a time where we intentionally set that aside so that we might grow. And the same is true for solitude. Being with others is a wonderful thing. Jesus was with others often. He ate meals. He, he was constantly around the crowds, which also was very draining. But then he took time uh, to be alone. He set aside his time with others so that he might focus on the things of God. Um, so this is what's called a, a, a discipline of abstinence. And spiritual writers have been writing about it down through the centuries. I have this little book up here. It's called The Imitation of Christ. Maybe you have read of this or heard of it. It is uh, the most read, the most published, uh, the most translated devotional in history. In fact, only the Bible has been read uh, and translated into more languages and read by more people down through the years than The Imitation of Christ. It was written by Thomas Akempis 600 years ago. This is the 600th anniversary of its writing. Um, and I read this when I was 22 years old. It had a powerful impact on me. I highly recommend it. It'll challenge you. It will stretch you because he writes from a different era. Um, and and it, it will help you grow in your faith. And the wonderful thing, you go, talk about a good side of technology, you can go out on Amazon and get it for free on a Kindle version, okay? Or if you want the paper book, it's just six bucks. And he has this chapter called The Love of Solitude and Silence. And he writes this, in silence and quiet, the devout soul advances in virtue and learns the hidden truths of Scripture. There she finds a flood of tears with which to bathe and cleanse herself nightly, that she may become the more intimate with her Creator, the further she withdraws from all the tumult of the world. For God and His holy angels will draw near to Him who withdraws from friends and acquaintances. 600-year-old wisdom for us today. Serious pursuit of God requires solitude and silence. So why? What happens in us? What happens to us when we take this seriously, when we practice this dis uh, discipline? I believe there are several uh, benefits of silence and solitude. First of all, it gives us a, a life-transforming opportunity to concentrate on God. We're so distracted by things throughout the day, getting alone with God, getting silent. And by the way, there's no solitude without silence. Okay, you can, be sol you can be alone, but you can have all kinds of noise going. You have this opportunity to focus on God. Listen to what the prophet Isaiah said. He says, this is what the sovereign Lord, the Holy One of Israel says, in repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. But you would have none of it. Oh, how we resist it, the prophet is saying. But he's saying, your strength is found in quietness and trust. And so take, that's why Jesus would get alone, so that he could concentrate on the Father. Secondly, it's a source of freedom from the pull of the crowd. We are such, um, um, we are so influenced by the crowd. Um, Groupthink is such a real thing. And if we're not careful, we'll just kind of go along with the flow because this is what we do if we're not thinking. We just get caught up in it the other night, uh, Friday night, went to the SEMO District Fair along with, I think, 50,000 other people uh, from the area, and it was packed, and it was fun, and, you know, you just kind of, I noticed how, I was noticing how the crowd works and just the reality, just how the dynamics of how people even move through um, a fair like that, and, and it's funny how all crowds lead to corn dog stands. I don't know what it is about that. But, uh, man, I sure love the corn dogs at, at, at the fair. Uh, and and, and there's, just, there's this reality that we just kind of get swept up with what's going on and those around us. And see, in solitude and silence, we break away from that. We break away. Because uh, the crowd can have a negative impact on us. There was some groundbreaking, powerful research done many years ago uh, using laboratory mice uh, to look at the effects that crowds have on people. And so what they did was in this group, one, one experiment, they gave a, a group of mice amphetamines. 
and they put them in this big can container. And you can imagine, they're just bouncing off the walls and they're going nuts, they're crazy. And then they put a mouse in there that did not have any amphetamines. And over time, the, mouse, the mice who had the amphetamines just killed themselves. They were just going so crazy. But what was interesting is the mouse that had not been given any amphetamines also died. Why? Because of all the craziness around it. That's how a crowd can affect us. In fact, they found that it, takes, it, it took 20 times more amphetamines to kill a mouse that was in solitude than it did a mouse that was in a group. In quietness and strength is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength, the scriptures say. Um, so another thing is, it, is it's a source of perspective where we can see things that trap us, that worry us, that oppress us. Now, I've been talking about the benefits of silence and solitude. Can we just acknowledge right, up, right at this point that it's a scary thing? I mean, after all, what do we do to our kids, you know? When they misbehave, little kids, what do we put them in? Time out, we, you know? Um, and and, and um, when a prisoner misbehaves, what do you do to a guy who's already locked up in jail? What do you do? You put them in Solitary confinement. Why? Because that's the worst punishment they can come up with. Um, we're, afraid of, we're afraid of this. And there's a reason. It's not just the technology, but there's a, there's a reason that we don't do this because when we get alone with our thoughts and we get alone with ourselves, all of a sudden, the worries, the insecurities, the fears... All of the stuff that's there below the surface begins to bubble to the top. And you know what we do? We reach for our phone. We reach for the, the radio. We turn it on. We want noise always going so that those things, those fears, those insecurities, those anxieties aren't controlling us. But have you ever thought that maybe that when you're alone and you truly get quiet, that the fear that comes to the surface, the insecurity, the anxiety, is what God is bringing to your attention so that it might be addressed, so that his grace might come to meet that thing that is stressing you out. And so instead of moving away from it in fear because of all this stuff that bubbles to the surface, use it as an opportunity to come to God and say, God, I don't know where this fear is coming from. I don't know why this is here. Would you, would you come and work on my heart? Lead me to your peace and grace. And it becomes an opportunity for God to begin to transform us. And then finally, I think the benefit of silence and solitude is it gives us victory over the tongue, which is so very hard. And James, he says this in, in his letter uh, about the tongue. Let's look up, up here on the screen. It says, all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue it is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse human beings who've been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. You know what I find? The less I talk, the better I get along with people. Huh? How about you? Even the most foolish person, if they sit there and don't say a word, you think they're so wise. Um, there is a strength in this discipline where you pull away for some time and you get alone. So how do you do this? I think, I think there's something to be said about us actually scheduling some time to do this, actually building it into your, your calendar. Uh, it, it appears that Jesus often used the early morning hours when it was still dark to get alone. I believe that was just part of his routine it wasn't like he just, oh, accidentally found the time. No, he was intentional about it. I've shared this over the years. It's something I've given myself to. Mo many days I get up about five. I spend the first hour or so reading the scriptures and then really listening and being quiet with God. And then I go on a walk um, and, and I'm alone. Except for my dog, he's there. Uh, but he didn't talk much. Um, and, and, and those two hours of silence and solitude that begin my day. Um, I, I just can't imagine with my day without it. So that's scheduled. 
But then you can grab little times, 15 minutes here or there, where you're in between activities. Again, what, what uh, uh, Sherry Turkle found out at MIT is that we used to have those times, but now we, feel, we grab for our phone. What if instead of that, you had that 15-minute breather and you just <sighs> exhaled? I said, here I am, God. Speak to me. And listen for the voice of God because here's what Scripture reveals over and again. God will not shout above the noise in our lives. It requires us to get alone. We have to get quiet where we hear that gentle whisper of the Holy Spirit. Um, and then and there's other times that you can schedule, but you know what I think the greatest, I think one of the greatest enemies to the spiritual life, and I'm not an anti-technology guy. Yeah, I, I held out against the cell phone really long, but hey, man, I've got an iPhone 10, okay? So, you know, I, I'm into the technology, all right? But you know what I find the greatest enemy to the spiritual life and the greatest thing that comes against me is my, is my smartphone. I get up in the morning, instead of going right to the scriptures, what do I do? Well, what did the Cardinals do last night? So I check the score, and then that leads me to read a couple articles about, you know, this going on or that going on in baseball, and then, I, then that leads me over to, uh, uh, oh, what's going on with that hurricane? Let's read the latest there, and I'm reading that, and then I start reading the news and all the events of the day, and then my day just goes, you know, to pot from there. Um, that's the biggest temptation. In fact, I, I, I just have to wonder that, that the technology of our day is beginning to erode our spiritual foundations. Because silence and solitude, friends, are essential. Essential for a walk with God. And then I would even take it a, fur, a, a step further and maybe every quarter or at least twice a year, schedule a half a day where you're away. Go on a retreat. Go someplace you really like and go there alone. If it's the woods, go out to the woods. Um, it, I, I go to um, a, um, a Cistercian monastery uh, once a year and go for a retreat, a silent retreat. I don't care where you go, but schedule some time and it's life-giving. And then you get back into the, into the grind. But again, there's always things that are working against this. Do you notice here in the, in the passage? Do you, know why, you see why Jesus' time alone was interrupted? The disciples came looking for him. Oh, we've got stuff to do. People are waiting for you. You've got appointments, Jesus. You've got to get over here. You've got to go do this. They're all waiting for you over here. You know what Jesus does? He says, that's great. Now I think we need to go over here. They were pulling him over this direction, and he went that direction. Why? Because in that time, he heard from the Father, and the Father said, go there. And he did. See what power comes to you in silence and solitude. Maybe the most spiritual thing you can do is after worship is over, get out your smartphone and use your technology for spiritual thing and just plug in some times throughout the week where you're going to block it out and you're going you're to enter into silence and solitude. And you're going to enter those scare, scary moments of really truly being alone with yourself. But also where you encounter God because a serious pursuit of God requires solitude and silence. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your example. We thank you for how you routinely got alone, got away, and sought the Father. May we seek to imitate you. Give us grace to follow those same practices so that we might have the same power and grace. Thank you that you meet us there. Thank you that you are speaking. If we will just get quiet enough to listen. And thank you, Lord, that you meet us when we come to this table to receive the sacrament, to uh, remember your love for us, your death for us on the cross. So thank you for your presence here among us and for this opportunity to come to the table and remember. In Jesus' name, amen.